All right, you guys are live. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Now that Arizona is still on Mountain Standard Time, but we translate it to Pacific Daylight Time because it's just too confusing for everybody. It's actually now seven o'clock back where you are, Jim, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. And we're here to talk about Jim's collection of stories under the title of the Refusal Camp. And he very kindly signed a bunch of them, which we have at the store. This is my advanced reading copy, which is sort of a paperback, but the real signed book is down at the bookstore. And for you Billy Boyle fans, I'm happy to say that there is a, a sort of a prequel to the first Billy Boyle, but there's mm -hmm. also a story about Billy Boyle's um, father, right? Father? Father and uncle. And uncle. So yes. it's kind of an origin story about them in the Boston PD and whatever. But there are other stories as well. So maybe, Jim, since I think part of the point of this was not to write Billy Boyle, maybe <laughs> maybe you'd like to talk about some of the other stories first, and then we'll wind up with Billy. Sure. Um, you know, I have to say, I have always been intimidated by short stories. Um, I tend to write along when, when I'm writing a novel. I like to explore an idea and I may go down a path for a little while and then wind it up and come back. And the thought of zeroing in on a narrative and stripping away all that, really, I was intimidated. Well, um, it is hard, isn't it? I mean, yeah. a short story has to have a very specific plot a very specific trajectory, and you don't have a wealth of time to develop your characters. Exactly, exactly. So I, I always said, oh, I can't do that. And uh, a few years ago, there was a, 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 I mean, you know about the Crime Bake Conference in New England? I've it's heard sort of like it. Sleuth Fest of Okay. Yeah, there there are a number of smaller regional crime conferences. Clam Bake is one, uh, Sleuth Fest in Florida, there's Killer Nashville. Um, right. Right. and there's there's more proliferating. I would try it again, proliferating. I'm tempted today to sign up for Shetland Noir, which is of course. In the middle of June. <laughs> the problem is, you know, for you East Coast people, it's not that big a trip, but for us, it's a much you know, yeah. it's a long haul. Yeah. It's like Iceland Noir, which takes right. place. I think the second weekend in November, and I have wanted to go to Reykjavik. Well, I've been there many times, but I've wanted to go to Reykjavik for that conference for years. But it's a full day and more going and a full day or more coming back, uh -huh. as opposed to maybe five hours from New York. Well, anyway, Crime Bank, New England-based conference, had a contest uh, for a short story set in New England. And uh -huh. I have been working on um, a novel set during the American Revolution. And I thought, well, I have the characters, you know, I, I have the setting, so maybe I could do a prequel. And it turned out that was my first short story, and it won the Al Blanchard Award for short stories at that conference. Well, congratulations. Is Thank that you. the first chestnut tree? That, that is, yes. Um, so that, that's in there. But, but what was important to me was it showed, oh, well, I, I could do a short story. But I was still kind of linking it to a book that I had done. Right. Um, so I got an inspiration going to the movies. I don't know if you saw the film yesterday. It was a film about a world in which everybody forgets the Beatles existed, except, and it doesn't matter why, except for one musician who remembers all the songs. Hmm. And he then gets rich and famous playing Beatles songs in a world where nobody else knows that the Beatles had existed. It was a fun movie, great music. But when I came out, I had this notion of, wow, what, what could we do that with literature? Could we do that with books? And, and how would that work? So um, that's when I cooked up the idea of glass, um, which like a, it's kind of a sci-fi thing, but an iPad from the present time. Uh, gets catapulted into the past um, through uh, a, a, a super collider accident. Um, it was fun doing the science research because I, I do like hard science fiction. Um, but anyway, uh, and somebody in 1972 finds this intact and powered up iPad, uh, but without a power cord. Uh, so they have to figure out what it is, 
And how to, once they do that, how to keep it powered and what it has on it right. is the collected works of Stephen King. So that that was my my, my brainstorm about how, what what would be the the contradictions in terms of time travel about Stephen King's works being sent to the past and somebody picks them up during the lifetime of a, of a young Stephen King. Um, so uh, Stephen King is in the story. He he takes yes, he, is. he shows up, but you know, yeah. inopportunely yeah. for our hero. But I right. I really enjoyed that one. I think it's a you know it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah. And and we did an event last week for A. J. Riddle's um, Quantum Radio, which okay. has a super colloidal collider yeah. and you know sort of similar things. So I was prepared for that when. Um, when I read your story, but I especially like the idea of Stephen of all authors who would really appreciate the concept. Yeah, I hope he picks it up and is, uh, have you shown he's not it offended you? that I revealed his secret about it, where his ideas come from. It's just a, you know. uh, right. but what that did for me was that was the first short story I wrote that was independent of any book I had written. So then, uh, then I sort of really got the bug for it and, and wanted to, to keep going. Um, now, there are others. The refusal camp uh, is is based on a, a events that happened in the Billy Boyle universe, but outside the books. Um, but uh, the other one that uh, was a little otherworldly was The Secret of Hemlock Hill. Uh, and that that's a ghost story. Uh, I had, you know, Shirley Jackson's The Haunting, books like that always have really uh, inspired me to want to write a ghost story. Uh, but I finally realized that I, I had the inspiration close to home because my wife, uh, Debbie, had attended Washington College in Maryland, and she ended up being haunted by a ghost. Really? Uh, 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 some of her classmates, not her friends, invited her one night to go with them to dig up the grave of a Civil War soldier. And this this is this is all true. She declined. She was not happy with the notion of digging up a grave, um, and they wanted to get the uniform and the buttons or whatever. Um, so they went out. They did dig up a grave, uh, and that night, a series of odd occurrences started happening in her room. And as college kids did back then, and probably still do now, uh, to solve it, she consulted a Ouija board. And the Ouija board told her it was the spirit of George Smith, a Union soldier who had been, it had been his grave that was disturbed. And he took refuge with her because she was the one that didn't go along with it. And George was a presence in her life for, for years and years, a very friendly spirit. Um, so I, I took that uh, ghostly occurrence and, and turned it into uh, a ghost story, The Secret of Hemlock Hill. So, and I hope George is pleased with it. <laughs> well, try the Ouija board and you can. Yeah, right. I'm a little worried. I'm a little scared to ask. Well, you know, you've got nine stars. I see we've unleashed a monster. I can just right. see this is going to be coming. But then again, you're a very prolific um, and disciplined writer. So the chance to write more than one novel a year probably really appeals to you. It does, especially the notion of, of a short story that I could do a couple in between books or, you know, set the book aside and work for a week on a short story. Uh, it's very freeing. If, you, if I want to do something different, um, it gives me that ability. And there's these little ideas that come up and what to do with them. You, know, you can't sure. write a novel with every idea, but there's a lot of short stories that can be written. Well, you can publish them digitally. There are all kinds of things you can do. You can do them in yeah. a Christmas newsletter. Or you can, in this case, there are nine collected in this one hardcover book, The Refusal Camp. But that doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, Amazon's been doing really well with its short story collections where they get some authors together and do do stories. You know, for a long time, short story genre took a huge hit because there wasn't any effective way or uh, profitable way to publish them with the demise of print magazines and all that. That had been, you know, where short stories really, um, did very well for, I don't know, Victorian era, this, I mean, think of Sherlock Holmes, those are all short stories. 
in the Strand magazine. Um, but with the demise of the printed magazine, uh, we had to wait for the digital age, I guess, to catch up and, you know. Also, I've been fortunate in having uh, Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine accept a number of mine. So thank goodness they're still in business. And, uh, I think they are. Ellery Queen and Alfred Hitchcock, aren't right. they still yeah. both going? Right. Yeah. And they probably have a fairly devoted... I mean, there are lots of... I'm not a short story reader, I have to say, as a general rule. I read so fast that, you know... Um, Gone before you start reading it. Well, uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I, there's some wonderful ones. I mean, I, you know, Oh, Henry's The Gift of the Magi is a story I, sure. I often think about. I mean, there are many classic short stories. And every year there's a collection, I think it's Houghton Mifflin, publishes um, the best short stories of the year, um, usually in October or November or something like that, with a series of Otto Penzler's had a lot to do with that, but there have been a bunch of guest editors um, Patrick, whom you know from our staff, he he put together an anthology in the Akashic Urban Noir series. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Well, it's a it's a remarkable effort, and it's been a huge success. They have taken city after city, and they have asked authors to write short stories, mystery short stories, because it is called noir, um, that focus on these cities. And I mean, they're just everywhere. And in some cases, they've done maybe two or three for Manhattan. There's certainly more than one L.A. And then it got international. So, you know, you have Paris Noir and whatever. Anyway, Patrick did Phoenix Noir. He put that one together. And one of the short stories in that collection won the Edgar for um, best short story. Luis Alberto Urea wrote one. And the other author of note that was in that uh, up that year, not in Patrick's book, but separately it was Dennis Lehane. So it was kind of a surprise that Luis walked off with the award, but he did. Um, and then Patrick did another one focused on um, automobiles. And he had some really interesting contributors. So, you know, you can do a themed collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Thriller Fest, you know, Thriller Fest does, um, the Thriller people do short story collections. And I think MWA as well. So if you belong to one of those organizations, right. you know, you can not only contribute, but you could probably volunteer to be an editor. I want to do a little show and tell, if I may. Um, recent, and during a recent move, I unpacked one of those boxes that you've had for years and you don't even know what's in it anymore. I found my short stories from my creative writing class in freshman high school English, wow. 1963. And I was, you know, I started by saying I'd always been intimidated by short stories. I like to write long. I don't know if you can read this, but the comment my teacher gave me. Can you see that? Yes, I do see it. Right. Too long. <laughs> so even at what 15, I don't know what, how old it was, I was writing too long. Right. Um, and I've got a whole stack of these. And it's what's amazing is I have remembered some of the comments, not quite correctly. I didn't even know I had these. Um, I have, this is fancy. I typed this one up. Uh -huh. um, and it's a, guess what? It's a World War II story. <laughs> he, he wrote a comment that had stayed with me. I, and so this is a story about a sergeant on a secret mission. And I remembered that he had written on it, next time, make it harder for the sergeant. And it was close to that, um, perhaps a little too easy for the sergeant. And that was a, a, my first lesson in obstacles that I had written, a story. it was too easy. He just kept going on and on and, and nothing really exciting happened. I put a lot of work into this and he gave me a B minus. So I, you know, I, I learned my lesson about obstacles, but it was fascinating to see a teacher a freshman in high school, um, really analyzing stories and, and giving critiques. Um, so Mr. Gillian is long gone, but I, I owe him a debt for that. And it was so much fun to go through these and, and see the, the prototype of uh, my storytelling. Maybe he'll come back and haunt you if you resonate. <laughs> the Actually, you know, you might have some good material in there that you could have that you've got all these years of experience. Maybe you could hone in on them. Well, I have to admit, I did copy a few from the Twilight Zone just 
changed a little bit. So I, oh, I you mean back then, to... not now, right? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. copyright or plagiarism probably wasn't as big a thing <laughs> for a high school <laughs> student as it would be if you actually tried to publish it, but there we go. Um, all right, so Billy Boyle, let's talk about um, Billy's family history because when we meet Billy, he's, um, he's already an experienced cop who has been pulled into the war effort and sent off. You know, I, I told you, I really didn't like, I didn't buy your initial premise for Billy all that well. I thought it was, to be honest, I thought it was sort of cheesy, but, you know, once I realized he isn't actually a, he's not a formal cousin, right? It's kind of an informal relationship to General Eisenhower. And it is a great pretext for getting him over there and getting him involved in investigations. So so I felt it's better a, when I realized he wasn't really just a short tail relative. <laughs> I think they called him a courtesy uncle. He was a right. distant relative of some sort, but the kind of guy that, you know, I had those growing up. I had uncles and they were just close friends of my parents. And um, so that's the relationship. And it does work as a vehicle for sending Ooh. Billy wherever I want him to go. So he's sort of the zealot um, of World War II. You no, know, it's worked out for your work. series. It's been, yeah. it's been terrific, you know, mm -hmm. although I, I don't know when you wrote the first one, if you could have envisioned how many Billy Boyle stories there were, there were going to be. <laughs> never, never, no. And we'll come we'll come back to September because in a way this is a preview of the next Billy Boyle, but we'll get back to that. So anyway, what is Billy's family? Because you do give us a um, a look here in Irish Tommy into Billy Boyle's dad and his uncle, as we previously mentioned. So tell us about them. So Billy's family is uh, Irish American uh, Boston family who have set themselves up within the Boston Police Department. Uh, and the reason for that, for just a little historical perspective, is after World War I, uh, the Boston Police Department did go on strike. Uh, they had not had uh, a raise in the, the pay grade for a starting policeman since 1860. Good you Lord. can look that up. And the reason is there was so much graft and corruption that everybody figured, well, you can make plenty of money as a cop. Why should we pay you more? Um, but it got to be too much. Uh, the whole department, went, the rank and file, went on strike. Uh, and Governor Calvin Coolidge uh, uh, called in the National Guard, eliminated the police department, and went looking around for replacements. And right after World War I, Irish Americans who had been in the service and who were denied employment elsewhere were a willing pool of people to come in and populate the police department. So that's where the whole Irish Boston police thing uh, came from. I so didn't realize it was that. I thought it was much further back. Was the New York no. police department similar? That I don't know. Um, but it was the police strike that really gave them entree into right. the ranks of the Because people department. didn't want, okay, that, yeah. that's really fascinating. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. I just assumed yeah. they'd always been Irish. Yeah. So Billy's uncle Dan and uh, his father, uh, Terrence, uh, are detectives, and they're the ones who make smooth the way for Billy's uh, ascension to detective. Um, but... Uh, this story um, takes place during the war uh, at the time when there were Nazi saboteurs being landed on the coast of New England, uh, Long Island, uh, and being hunted by the FBI and the local police. Uh, so this is really his Uncle Dan's story about hunting down um, uh, bank robbers who had uh, taken out an armored car, but also stumbling across a connection to real life um, Nazi spies. So while Billy is overseas doing various kinds of investigations in the army, back home, his uncle and his dad are doing active policing in Boston. What? Yeah. Were they? And, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I know that, that in other, I've read many other books which have talked about the difficulties of maintaining law and order in police departments during both wars because so many people enlisted and went overseas. Um, were the father and uncle therefore a little too old for active service and that's why they stayed as cops in Boston? Yes, they 
both had served in the First World War. And part of the origin story of Billy is their older brother, Frank, the oldest of the three brothers, was killed uh, in France. And as good Irish Republicans, they always resented the fact that their, their brother Frank had been killed in a war in their eyes to save the British Empire. So that's why they cooked up this whole scheme for Billy to be assigned to the staff of uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, a very distant relative. Um, we found out later in a book, the book that involves Jack Kennedy, that it was the Kennedy family that helped them pull those strings. Um, but th that that all all this history uh, comes from real life and informs these fictional characters and how they view the world and how they act within the world. Um, and apropos to St. Patrick's Day this week, um, I'll just mention that Evil for Evil, the fourth book in the series, is set in I Ireland, Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and uh, Billy's Uncle Dan uh, makes an appearance there traveling on behalf of the IRA, and he encounters him in that book. So uh, I liked him as a character, um, you know, sort of the, the bad, good uncle um, uh, type, and uh, so we may see him in another short story. That would be wonderful. You know, if you're actually looking for material, there's wonderful material there in the Kennedy, the origin of the, the Kennedy fortune during Prohibition, doing rum oh, yeah. running from, you know, Canada down to Boston. Mm -hmm. um, I feel sure that you could manage a story or two there. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Since the Kennedys were, you know, involved in, in what you're writing about. Did you see there's a documentary being made about or about to come out about Rosemary Kennedy and her really tragic story? Uh Oh, yes. I, I've seen one. I don't know if this is a new one, but uh, this is a new one, I think. Oh. Um, it was, I think I read about it today in either the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what a terrible thing that was that um, it was just an accident of birth that left her in that bad shape. But then the lobotomy was so additionally cruel that. And there are, there's some photographs of her. Where it, she just looks like a completely normal young girl. I, I don't know how, how bad her life was on a daily basis and how competent or not she was, but boy, what they what they did to her was just uh, it was almost murder. Well, it really was. I think once she had the lobotomy, but you know she lived to be, I don't know, in her eighties. But once she I, had the lobotomy, uh, it was you know she was. It was as you say, they put her in a home. They, they paid murder. this home a lot of money yeah. uh, to, to, to keep her behind the out of sight. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you know neurosurgery today is advanced to the point where they could have done anything to help her um, yeah. because it was a, a birth injury. It's really a terrible story about Rose Rose Kennedy's gynecologist or something couldn't make it um, right when she went into labor, and so she was counseled to keep her legs together and not let the baby be born until the man got there. And so Rosemary, who was this unlucky baby, suffered um, real brain damage from that. I don't remember if it was lack of oxygen or whether it was pressure or whatever, but it was a completely needless, you know, um, injury. Um, and then because of the injury, her behavior was such that Joe thought she could be a family embarrassment. And that's why he ordered the lobotomy. Um, you know, he was not, I have to say, he was not a nice person, Joe Kennedy. Family embarrassment would have been worse to him than doing that to his daughter, which was incomprehensible. So well, he was a he was a tough old guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, plenty of material there if you wanted to explore right. stories, not about rosemary particularly, but I think I don't think people really anymore inquire deeply into the origins of the Kennedy fortune and how they rose to prominence. I mean, the whole story is really a Greek tragedy from start to finish, if you, you know, if you really look at it. But you could also kind of argue that some of it was retribution, unfortunately, visited upon the children and not upon Joe himself. Yeah. You know? Well, even what he put his oldest son Joe through, uh, I mean, Joe was tortured, uh, wanting to please his father constantly. Uh, and he almost had a nervous breakdown when Jack Kennedy became so famous over P2109 because he had eclipsed Joe uh, in his father's eyes. Um, so 
A lot of angst yeah. in that family. No, there there really is. And Jack had, you know, whatever unfortunate malady afflicted him. Your friend Francine um, Matthews wrote a really brilliant book oh, called Jack yes. 1939. Jack 1939. Yeah. Incredible book um, yeah. in which she postulates what might have been uh, the case with Jack in terms of um, whatever neurological deficits that he had and how they affected him. But anyway, we're straying from, straying from the point. So that's the story about Joe's father and uncle and how Billy, sorry, Billy's father and uncle and how Billy was able to go overseas. But let's talk a little bit about the preview to the first Billy Boyle, because one of the things that made it so fascinating was the Norwegian history, because Norway Norway really got clobbered by the Nazis in that initial blitzkrieg thing they did. You know, they took over the Netherlands and they motored right over Norway. And then there's quizzling and all the rest of it. But the King of Norway is really a remarkable, a remarkable man. And um, I've been to Norway and been to Oslo, been to the um, the fort there, the what's it called? Acker House, something like that. Where there's a, a World War II museum and all, but I love your story in this book. Be so it's your story. So why don't you tell us about it? Well, I, I'll start off by saying I made a um, beginning writer's mistake and uh, wrote a prologue, which prologues can be okay, but this was just too long and it didn't introduce Billy. So by the time I sent it into Soho um, uh, and uh, Laura Horusco wrote it, read it. She said, well, we can't, we can't do this. It's too long. And I agreed with her, but I kept it all that time. And I thought uh, at some point, I'd like to just put it out um, for people maybe who have already read the book. It's a little bit of background into the right. Norwegian characters. Uh, so I, I tightened it up a little bit uh, and thought it would make a good uh, introduction, maybe get some people uh, interested in uh, reading the first book. And it really tells the story of the three Norwegian characters, one of whom is a German spy, but you don't know which one, and what led them uh, to go to England and continue the war. Uh, so it's their journey, uh, just one step ahead of the German troops to meet the uh, an English ship uh, at a port and uh, help the king and the gold reserves of Norway uh, get to England. Uh, and just how they did the gold reserves is an amazing story. They, they snuck them out of the country uh, virtually intact, um, except for the one gold coin that uh, I had somebody take with them. Of course you did. Right. <laughs> you know, Norway is just, I mean, think of the things that happened there. There was the force that went to, um, their stories based on it. But anyway, didn't they ski across and hit the heavy water plant? that kept right. Germany yeah. from really having nuclear power. And then I've been, I'm trying to remember the name of the Norwegian town. We crossed over to it. We were in Lapland and there's a train that goes from Lapland and it crossed over to this town, which is on the West coast of Norway. And it is um, the farthest that the Nazis got. It was the, do you remember the name of it? It's, it's, is that Narvik? Yes, thank you. Narvik, Norway. Thank you. I just couldn't think of the name of it. Um, and, you know, the Norwegians really played a much more significant role yeah. in the war than many of us realize. And what a moral dilemma, the heavy water that the Germans were shipping out of Norway, they were taking it on a ferry across a huge lake. And yeah. the Norwegians decided it was the only place they could eliminate of the heavy water, because if they blew a hole in the ferry, it would sink to the bottom of a very deep lake. But their own people were on the ferry, but they went ahead and did it. Um, and talk about an agonizing moral dilemma. Um, but that, Terrible. It's like, Churchill, in it's like Churchill and Coventry letting the bombing go right. through so the Germans wouldn't recognize that the Enigma code had been broken. Right. You know, I mean, there were, there were agonizing choices all during World War II. And having traveled, when I finally did agree to travel to Germany, because I'm a child of the war, so it took me a long time to think about whether I would really want to go there. But when we were publishers, the Frankfurt Book Fair was an important thing to go to. So we ended up doing a lot of traveling in Germany. And I can remember one city in particular where the Germans were just sort of baffled by why, still baffled, 
by why they had been bombed. They moved the treasures of their cathedral. They moved their beautiful carved pews and stained glass and everything down into the uh, nave, I mean, the um, undercroft of the church to protect it now. But many of them never really seem to understand what happened, you know, why that would have been would have been true. So I think the Russians are probably going to end up with the same, you know, same thing. They may never understand the responsibility of Russia unprovoked, you know, going in to go after the Ukraine. Um, and and I, I find that so interesting because it was so clear that, you know, it was Hitler in a quest for power. Nobody really wanted the war. And he declared war on us. So I know. To... I've been pointing that out to people. It came up in something not too long ago, a particularly interesting book. And I recognize that I think many Americans think that we declared war on Germany. You know, but in truth, Hitler Hitler declared war on us, and it was his other mistake besides invading Russia. Right. right. There was such a so little appetite among Americans to fight another European war. Right. And I think we'd been forced to fight the Japanese, but it's not all clear to me that Roosevelt could have gotten gotten us into war in Europe. But when Hitler gratuitously decided to declare a war in the United States, he solved the whole problem. Yeah. Which nicely brings us to the last story in right. this book, the vengeance weapon. Vengeance weapon. Um, one of the things that I'm intrigued by in stories is... Uh, switched identities. And this story starts off in a concentration camp, Dora Middlebau, where slave laborers, where slave labor was used to create the V2s to build the rockets uh, that, that were sent against England. Um, and this is a story of, of a, a, a survivor of that camp who makes his way to the United States by taking on the identity of a, a German scientist who was killed in the last days of the war and ends up working uh, at uh, a NASA-like facility uh, and sees one of his tormentors, uh, a scientist from the camp, uh, come to work and uh, creates a plan to get his own vengeance on him. Uh, and it just has themes of, the themes of switched identities, of uh, revenge, uh, uh, intrigued me. And this this was a tale that I wanted to tell, especially because the more I researched that and learned about Werner von Braun and right. his role, it's just the way we whitewashed uh, Nazis like him. And he, he was a member of the SS. He was clever. He was only ever photographed in an SS uniform once. He was very careful to cultivate the image of the civilian scientist, even during the war as he was building the V-2 rockets. Um, and he had a great PR sense and he sold himself to the Americans, but um, he, he knew that thousands of slave laborers were dying under his watch and did nothing about it. So he's, I couldn't address killing Werner von Braun because it didn't happen, but I have a substitute. He stands in to, to take the punishment that I think he should have gotten. Well, unfortunately, I think um, many German scientists were whitewashed rather than let them move to the communist camp because mm -hmm. the pivot from you know fascism to fighting communism was so rapid. I mean, Churchill saw it as early as 46. I think wasn't his wasn't his uh, Iron Curtain speech, it was 47 or something like that. Or here, here in the U.S., I think. Yeah, but I mean, it was right after the war. So I think yeah. um, even if Stalin was a partner, you know, with the Allies during the war, I think as soon as the war was resolved, it became pretty clear that communist Russia was going to be, you know, a major. And so I think I think a lot of it was that either execute those guys or bring them over and put them to work for us. And you're right that. Um, it was the moral problem was that these guys actually did deserve to go on trial in Nuremberg and did deserve to be, you know, punished like the more obvious Nazis, but they were too useful. You know, uh, Braun would make a joke. Oh, I, I, I aimed for the moon, but I occasionally hit London. 
that that was his one liner and it was he treated it as a joke which just offended me maybe more than right than anything else. well he so, was he was certainly big in rocketry and yeah. you know that the the war does as war often does accelerated technological advances you know where people are looking for some kind of an edge and yeah. um in weaponry and so forth and you know say what you will the germans have been brilliant engineers um I remember when we went to Dubai, I guess the only time I've ever been to Dubai, um, the airport there is an absolute maze of German engineering, the escalators, the elevators, you know, all of it is, um, and it's it's really remarkable. And, you know, I drive a Mercedes, which I my father till the day he died would never buy a Japanese car. He just would not, you know, invest in one, nor a German one. You know, it was always going to be General Motors for him. But here I am, you know, with my Mercedes. And Rob has a Volvo, which is Swedish. So <laughs> so there we are. But, you know, war, war memories and shifting alliances really, you know, change things. 30, 40 years on after a war, you know, it's like chess. Well, not chess, but, you know, some game where everybody realigns the board. And it all makes great grit for writing. For stories. Why is World War II so fascinating to you? I, you know, I really put it back to childhood. And when I was a kid, maybe 10 years old, everybody on my street, our dads were all in the war. We all had different stories we heard from them. It was part of the fabric of, uh, of the daily life uh, to talk about what did your dad do in the war and, and whose dad had the the craziest story. Uh, so I think I just grew up with that. And also, uh, my mother was born in Germany, came over as a young child uh, in the 20s. Um, and my grandfather was involved in the German uh, mutiny. Uh, he was a worker in the docks in Hamburg, uh, building U-boats. Uh, they went on strike uh, to end the war. Uh, so he had a lot of stories uh, from a very radical perspective. Um, and I always felt like I had that little connection with that history. So, well, there's some of the why. stories. I mean, the war, you know, tragically, but analytically put, is an absolute gift to writers. And you know, <laughs> currently, one of the reasons I like the Billy Boyle stories so much, aside from, you know, the grace of your writing and the interesting, in all the interesting places you go, all the different war theaters and all is that there is such a tsunami currently of World War II stories about women. I feel like I just can't bring myself to read another one. You know, I mean, and and I think it's great because I think that women were heroic in the war in quieter ways, many of them, but, you know, did remarkable things. And, um, and I think it's great their stories are told, but I think that as publishing often does, it achieves a glut. Because something became, you know, the nightingale or whatever becomes hugely popular. And then everybody piles on to the point where you think, I just can't read another. It was true after the Da Vinci Code. I used to call them Da Vinci clones. And practically every book that was published was a religious conspiracy thriller. And that went on for quite a while. And you just got to the point where you thought, I don't care how good it is. I just can't read another one. Well, I'll just keep plugging along with Billy. We'll just through this little uh you know, this trend well so i understand that the one coming in september is what set in an english village yes i don't know if you've received a, an arc yet no for so this one i, I no. make sure you do uh it's called proud sorrows and because um i try to uh, modulate uh, the tone of each book, so I, I don't do a repeat of a, a, you know an exact um, uh, battle or uh, intrigue. Uh, so I decided it was time for this whole crew to have a rest. Uh, and you know that Billy's love, Diana Seton, uh, her father uh, comes from Seton Manor out in the English countryside. So they all get a week's leave to relax. And I had been intrigued by a picture I saw of. Um, a World War II plane uh, being revealed uh, right off the English coast by the shifting tides. And uh, after 
60, 70 years, it just sort of came up out of the muck uh, and was salvaged. So uh, that got me thinking, I, I won't go into it too much, but we have this quiet English village. Um, and there is a plane that, that, that surfaces like that and reveals some secret that everybody wants to keep hidden. So what uh, was a what was a quiet the your standard quiet English village and uh, with murder of course uh, interrupts uh, Billy's uh, leave uh, and uh, Sir Sir Richard Seaton Diana's father becomes a suspect and he has to clear his name uh, and I had a great fun uh, with one of the the walk on characters if you were ever a fan of the Lord Peter Whimsy Mysteries on Masterpiece Theater. Of course. Uh, you might know Ian Carmichael, the actor who played Peter Whimsy. Well, it turns out he was a World War II vet. Uh, he served in the Royal Tank Corps. Uh, he lost a finger. And if you ever look at his photos, he's always photographed with his hand nonchalantly in his pocket because of his missing finger. It turns out that he realistically could have been in this place at that time uh, doing something for the military. So we have uh, Ian Carmichael, ma Major Ian Carmichael at that time, assisting Billy in his investigations. Uh, and I had a heck of a time not having Bunter show up and, and help him out with his, uh, with his photography or something. Because reading his autobiography, he, he was not an aristocrat. He came from a, a working class family, but he adopted that the tone that, uh, you know, quite all right chap tone. So uh, there was a lot of fun writing him. Uh, and uh, uh, he does end up having a, a hand in solving the mystery. So uh, that was a fun part. But we also got to explore uh, the British Union of Fascists and all these homegrown fascists that were uh, running around in England, even at that time. Uh, so uh, so you, know, you, had, you had mostly in the black shirts kind of floating exactly. around in the background. Uh, uh, and in 1944 was when not Mosley, but a lot of his followers were released from prison. Uh, the authorities figured they had enough of them had served their time. They could be let loose. Uh, but that did not work out well, as we will find out here. I love that. So I have an Ian Carmichael story for you. Ah. Right. Yeah. So I loved him. He was in the... Um, not the Edward Petheridge, Peter Whimsy on television. And that was only for the four, well, actually three, because I'm not sure they ever made the fourth one, the Harriet Vane ones, um, which ended with Gowdy Night. Yeah. And that was Edward, Edward Petheridge. And he was much more really like Peter Whimsy, I think, than Ian Carmichael, who was, you know, elegant and thin and blonde and very aristocratic and all. Ian Carmichael was the earlier Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Wimsey TV guy. And he was more, he was broader. He could be kind of, a, and in fact, true in the Sayers stories too, he could be kind of a silly ass as they would say, you know, in the early, um, in the early Sayers. So he was very well cast really um, as that. But anyway, I was used to him. I had seen all of the, um, Ian Carmichael, Dorothy Sayer stuff on Masterpiece Theater and all. I loved it. So I was in England in 1986 for several months. And part of that time, I went to York. Um, and there's a wonderful Royal Theater in York. And I was staying right up the road um, at, a, at a beautiful small hotel right next to York Minster. And I lugged all my luggage up on the third floor because if you were up there and you couldn't see the city or hear the traffic and all when the bells rang. It was a very medieval experience. But anyway, I was on my own. So I got myself a ticket to go down to the Theater Royal in York to see Pride and Prejudice. And when I got there, I looked at the staging and it was really interesting. Mr. Bennett sat in a large chair in the middle of the stage throughout the entire performance of Pride and Prejudice. And all of the Bennett family swirled around him, but he was the focal point. He was like the hub of the wheel. And it was Ian Carmichael. And I kept trying to adjust to Ian Carmichael <laughs> as Mr. Bennett instead of being Lord Peter Whimsey. But you know what? He was absolutely terrific. Because really, if you think about it, Mr. Bennett, you know, has a much more substantial role 
in the lives of, of all the characters than he's often given credit for. Um, and, and I thought it, it was the best Pride and Prejudice. I liked it still better than any of the other ones, even though it's kind of hard not to love, you know, the couple of interpretations since. Yeah. And it's also interesting that it's a book that can be portrayed or staged, maybe is a better word. It's a it's a book that can be dramatized differently according to whether it's a live stage performance or whether it's a you know film or whether it's a TV series or depending on the casting and all. But I still see Ian Carmichael sitting there in this big chair in this Georgian kind of a house. And, you know, all of the sisters and Mr. Darcy and everybody are revolving around him. He never leaves the stage. Wow. wow. It's great. And I was so thankful that I got to see him that way so that my only memory of him is not just as right. Lord Peter Whimsey, because right. he was a very talented actor. But how wonderful that you've written him into your book. I will really look yeah. forward to that. And his autobiography, Will the Real Ian Carmichael, um, is a lot of fun to read. So if, if you haven't read that, I didn't. I didn't even know there was one. So yeah. thank you for letting me know. Yeah. I will. I will certainly engage in that. So Jacob, we've probably exhausted all our blather. Why don't you come forward and see if you have any comments from the audience that would like airing? He has to appear in the little magic screen. There he is. All right, I got a hardcover copy of your book here too, so we can show. Oh, wonderful. All right. Um, Judy Singer asks, hey Jim, how many stories are in your collection and uh, are any of them about Billy Boyle and friends? Uh, I think it's nine. I don't there are nine stories up. and two of them are related to Billy Boyle. Yeah, um, Billy is not in any of them. And no. the, the notion I have is that there's so many um, characters that appear in one book or maybe two, so they, I, in my mind, they're still going on and living their lives and there are stories to tell. So I think the more short stories I write probably will not include Billy Boyle because he's in a book every year. So we'll maybe look at some of the subsidiary characters and uh, see what we can learn from them. In your Billy Boyle series, do you take a lot of inspiration from actual um characters in, in real life, actual people, um, actual uh, events. Um, is, is that is that part of it or does it, I think we lost your art, James? That's the touchstone of this. Um, you hearing me okay? Yeah, yeah you have you to go. stay sitting forward when you back up, your voice yeah. disappears. Um, poor posture, you know, I'm still here on that. Anyway, yes, the, the that's what I try to uh, find in each book is a real event and real people and wrap the fictional bits, the mystery around those. Um, so the book I'm writing now for um, 24 um, is set during the first days of the Battle of the Bulge. And I encountered another real life English actor, uh, David Niven, who was trained as a commando, was a uh, uh, liaison to General Montgomery uh, from the front lines. So we've got David Niven uh, and Billy and his friends uh, tooling around uh, France, not quite realizing what's about to pour over them. Uh, and they're looking for artwork uh, that the Germans uh, stole, uh, took out of Paris and hid away in various places. That's all real. David Niven is real. The Battle of the Bulge is real. But that's the kind of setting I like to take and and put Billy into and see what churns up in there as he tries to deal with everything that's being thrown at them. That's right. And some of the characters, well, notably in the last prologue, the King of Norway is um, yes. King Hakon is a real character. And he shows up in the first Billy Boyle book because the Norwegian court in exile in England is a major pivot of the first Billy Boyle called, amazingly, Billy Boyle. And you also mentioned something about writing a um, a uh, American Revolution story. Is it yes. Idea? Are you currently yeah. working on that? Uh, that is, uh, the book is Free Gift, uh, and it's the story of Free Gift Cooper, uh, a young man who is enslaved in uh, colonial Connecticut, 
uh, and with the advent of the American Revolution, uh, the man who owns him uh, decides to free him. Uh, there was a movement among Northern slave owners uh, who were for the cause of liberty uh, to free the, the people they owned, uh, seeing that it was incompatible to have a slave and be for liberty. Um, so it's a sort of a coming of age story, but it all, also explores his connection uh, with Benedict Arnold and the burning of New London, which is one of the, the, the greatest terrorist acts inflicted on our nation at, in that century. Um, so uh, the horse chestnut tree, the short story in this book is a prequel uh, to that story. Okay. Was that difficult for you to go into that time period after writing World War II, two stories for so long? Was that? Um, no, it was refreshing uh, yeah. because I got to speak in a slightly archaic uh, a dialogue. Uh, the pattern of speech back then was very different, a touch more formal, even among uh, the uneducated classes, there was a different way of speaking, um, a, a little more stilted, a little more creative, I think. Uh, so it was so much fun uh, to write in that vernacular. Uh, and also uh, writing it from Prigib's point of view, he's suddenly in a world that has been denied him and he's seeing the whole world through new eyes. Uh, so it was fun to write. Uh, that kind of exploration of that coming of age story. Great. I mean, yeah, if you wrote it in a modern voice, it wouldn't quite come through. It would not work. No. Yeah. Um, so I think that is it for. Um, I have a question you, that I meant to ask and I forgot. Out of all the nine stories, why is the one called The Refusal Camp the title of the book? I was really. No, originally it was going to be called Vengeance uh, because that's the last story. It's almost a bit of, it's almost a novelette in length. Um, but we decided that has too, too much, it almost like a comic book sense to it. And we could recast. And uh, I suggested the refusal camp because I was really intrigued by the notion of what it meant to be in the refusal camp. Uh, when I first read mention of this in a history of the Raven's book, Concentration Camp for Women, uh, a woman said, we, we refused to work on these weapons. We were in the refusal camp. Uh, and I, I, I thought, what a brave thing that was to say and, and put yourself in that position. And that phrase just stuck with me. So I thought it was uh, a catchy yet meaningful title and communicated more than vengeance would, which is sort of broad and um right no i agree that's, with you. It. that's we, it we hadn't talked about the refusal camp and yeah. so i thought that we could end by pointing that out this is a really wonderful collection um varied voices varied theaters um for billy boyle fans there's a lot to love if you've never read billy boyle this may inspire you to do it and we will work out something with Jim for September. Do you remember the publication date, Jim, for your September book? It's my birthday, September 5th. Right, which is a really complicated week. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, either, yeah. either Jim will come and see us or we will figure out something for September right. because I'm happy to say that he has signed all of his Billy Boyle books for us and now the refusal camp. So we can't break that faith, can we? Oh, right. So thank you all very much for joining us. Don't forget, as Jacob is pointing out, we do have autographed copies of the refusal camp. And I think, you know, if you really want to look ahead, this would be a nifty Father's Day gift, because even if he's not a great reader, he can dip in and out. One of the great things about short stories is that you can read one comfortably in a relatively short space of time. You can put it, you know, pick it up and put it down. So you could plan ahead and buy dad a gift, right? All right, good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. You bet. Bye. -bye.